In today's show, we're going to look at the PowerShell switch statement. The switch statement's used to replace nested and multiple ifs when you're trying to evaluate one piece of data against a bunch of criteria. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward commandlet. It's pretty compact, though. It's a lot cleaner way of doing things. So let's just dive in and take a look. But first, here's our intro. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shane Young with Bold Zebras. Those guys. And today's show is about the switch statement. So the switch statement is kind of like building on the if statement. So if you've watched the previous videos on the if statements, you know that ifs are a big part of your PowerShell, right? It's a logic thing. Grab this stuff. If it's this, do this. If it's this, do this. And with the problem with if statements is it's real easy to get yourself in situations where you end up with a bunch of nested ifs and else ifs and that type of stuff. And it turns out that the PowerShell teams provide us with the switch statement, which allows us to do a little cleaner look at that because we can actually go in there and just do one, uh, one tight little setup and kind of take advantage of it. So let's just dive in and look at that. If we switch over here to my desktop, I'm going to open up the ISE. And because no one likes to watch me type, I've kind of got most of this stuff uh, all done, so we just work through it. But the first thing I want to show you an example of is this is a typical if statement that happens, right? So what are we doing here? We're clearing the screen, we're setting the variable cal equal to two. And then like, hey, if cal is equal to zero, right on the screen, it was zero. Else if, right? So if it's not that, then go try this if. Is it equal to one? Then write one, et cetera. No, it's none of those. All right, so if it was none of those, then we're going to write it wasn't any of those. And if we run this, we should just see it was two. If we change this to be seven and run it again, right, it wasn't any of those. So that's a pretty typical scenario, right? I know I'm guilty of writing my PowerShell code that very same way as well. So what I want to do is I want to show you how the switch statement lets us get away from that uh, nested chaos and do it in a little cleaner uh, ma manner. So let's switch over here to this tab. We'll start with a very simple switch statement. So literally all we're going to do is we're going to say switch, and then we're going to provide it a value. So right now we just typed in the value to. Um, we, we're going to look at, as we go through this, how we can do that with a variable. We can prompt the user. We can get it from, you know, a, a different PowerShell command, like that type of stuff. But for right now, we just said, all right, switch on the value of the number two. And so then we have the old curly braces. And then we just have all the different values that we want to check. So if the value we've typed here was zero, then it would say we type zero. One, you type one, two, you type two, right? Pretty straightforward, I think. And so if we do run script, we should just see you type two. If we change this value here, because this is the value we're checking, and we make this value zero, same thing, you type zero. Now what we didn't do here though yet is if we do three, nothing happens, right? Because that's what it, essentially, right? Switch on three, three does not match anything there. So then we said, all right, we're not gonna do any of those uh, commands. So pretty clean, good. So let's make it a little, let's that introduce a new concept. And so this next concept here, we're going to take that switch parameter, same thing we had before, and we just added this one line. And this is a default line, so you didn't type the correct thing. So if we run this now, we type 2, yep. But if we put 7 in this time, what's going to happen? You probably know. You didn't type the correct thing, right? So kind of like our else in that previous uh, if example we were doing. So we checked, switch wasn't 0, it wasn't 1, it wasn't 2. All right, then do this default value for us, the, the if equivalent of an else. So that's a real quick, easy way to look at all this, but this is really the core of what switch is. If you get this, then I got a couple little tricks I want to show you, but this is what switch is all about. It's just getting us away from having lots and lots of ifs. I know, like I did a reporting, a SQL Server reporting services project, and I was grabbing the report type, and then I... I was I messed up, right? I had the first if statement was if report type was X and then a whole bunch of code. And then the second one was uh, if, if report type was Y, do this whole bunch of code. And I, you know, I was a perfect example where I could have used a switch in the real world. And quite frankly, I just hadn't used a switch before. So I just did a bunch of ifs. Would have been a lot cleaner to switch on that command. All right. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context. Let's drill in and let's make this a little more complicated. So in this example, what we're going to do is we're just going to show you the idea that you can use a variable there, right? So we're going to switch on the number used user typed variable, and we're going to get that by prompting them. 
So all of this code down here, all the switch code other than this variable portion is the same. So if we hit play, what is your number? I'll type in, uh, I'll type in one, you typed one. Um, then we can do it again. And let's type in two, you know, it, it works. Okay, great. And then let's type in 70, 777, Ooh, big number. You didn't type the correct thing. So same exact concept we had on the previous screen. This is just showing you how you switch on a variable. Pretty cool. Um, and if you haven't done this before, I don't think I've done a video on read host. If you need me to do one on read host, leave me a comment below, tell me that. But read host is what prompted the user to type in, you know, what is your number? In our case, it was 777. Cool, cool. All right, next up, let's go to the next tab. Let's make this a little more different. And so here we're gonna do a little bit of using real data. And so what I'm gonna do in this example, uh, we're gonna take and we're gonna build this out several times, but we're going to do, uh, the first step here is we're gonna do get process and put all the process objects into the prox variable, right? And so we know that if we typed in get process down here, just to remember what's in there, boom. You know, once again, this is not a normal, probably nothing you're ever actually going to do, but I know that every one of you running PowerShell can do get process. So I like to make examples you can follow along with instead of using some SharePoint stuff or some SQL stuff, which you might not have access to. So that's why I use get process all the time, in case you're wondering. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna do a for each. Remember there was video on that. So if you're unfamiliar with how for each's work, um, you can check out that video. But basically, right, so for each P in process or procs, right? So uh, for every object in there, and we're just going to call the object, we're going to assign it the value of dollar sign $p. Remember, and you could change this, this could, could be process name, this could be, you know, anything you want, but we're just using um, a value here to represent one, uh, one the process in the current pipe. And so if, if prox has 412 processes running, then we're going to do this loop 412 times, one time for each object that's in that variable, okay? So, for each P in prox. And then what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do a switch. And on this, look, we got a little more complicated. We're gonna do a switch on the P object, but we're gonna do it for process name. So we're gonna take a property, right? So we're switching on the property process name. And if we scroll back way up here, sorry, I'm still scrolling. Don't worry, I'm almost there. Right, we can see process name is one of the properties of the processes. And so we're gonna do things like get Chrome and Camtasia and that type of stuff back, okay? And so then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to essentially say, all right, if it's Chrome, write to the host, found Chrome, and write that in red. If it's Microsoft Edge CP, which is the content processor for the Edge tabs, you don't care, uh, we're gonna write host found Edge, and we're gonna write that in yellow. And then we're going to have a default and no match. Okay, so. Really no new concepts here, just showing you you can apply a little more advanced stuff. So if we hit uh, play, it'll clear our screen off. And now as I'm scrolling through all the no matches, there's a lot of them, right? So then there's the group of edge CPs, they're all in yellow. And then there's all my chromes and they're all in red. Pretty straightforward, right? But that's just kind of reinforcing with you that, you know, we can what? We can match on a variable's property even. And, we, you know, we're doing string matches here. And then we're doing, and we're running a full-on commandlet uh, when that's done. All right? All right, so you guys, you're, I'm feeling good. You're doing good, right? Yay. So then let's make this even a little more tricky. Okay, so here what I wanted to do was I wanted to introduce you to the concept of the wild card. So one of the neat things about Switch, right, if we type in Switch right here real quick, there are some different things you have available to you. So you can make, say, hey, I want to do a case sensitive because by default it does a case insensitive match. I need exacts, I'm matching files, I want regex, or as we're going to do in this example, we're going to do a wild card match. And if you want to explore all that more, um, I didn't plan on telling you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway now, do a get help about switch and that will give you the default uh, PowerShell help. It's got some examples and gets into all those things like how regex and all that works. Regex is a little too out there for us right now. We haven't gotten the channel there, so we're not gonna dive into any of that today. But if you want to, there's the link, or that's how you get to it. All right, clear that out. So let's look at this one. So we're gonna clear the screen again. We're gonna put all the uh, pr processes in the procs variable. And for each one of those pro uh, procs, and so this time with our switch, what we did, we said we want to do a switch 
and we're going to do a wild card switch. So that's going to be important. We have to specify this wild card to do the, uh, the language we use below. So then we're going to say dollar sign p dot process name. And so for Chrome, we're not doing any type of wildcard match. We're just going to do the same thing. If it says Chrome, we're going to write it in red. But it turns out that if you scroll through the list of processes, there is a Microsoft Edge process and there is a Microsoft Edge CP process. And so I want to make sure that I'm matching both of those this time. So I did Microsoft E dollar sign, or sorry, not E dollar sign, E asterisk, meaning the wildcard symbol, right? So match anything that starts with Microsoft E and then afterwards. And there's a lot of different matching and wildcard uh, things you can use, like question marks and that type of stuff, but we're not going to overcomplicate it. I, I told you where in the help file that stuff was. But that's then going to return for us all the matches for Microsoft Edge and Microsoft Edge CP. Also, before we run this, I want to show you I introduced something else that was new here. Dollar sign underscore, right? So we've used dollar sign underscore before in some of our looping, uh, like the for each object loop. And because that's that whole idea that it represents the current object, right? The current thing in the pipe. And so in this example, dollar sign underscore is the string that uh, the switch statement was checking on. So in our example, it's process name. So if we do found dollar sign underscore, right, then it's going to say Microsoft Edge or Microsoft Edge CP because we know we could have either one of those values being matched there. And all the Chrome ones should just say Chrome. So this is how you take advantage of the current one and you can reference it. So for example, when you're, you're labeling, you're reporting, you know, variable names, whatever you want to do, you can use that dollar sign underscore to represent what you captured in the switch statement. The last thing I did here was I went and I uh, put a uh, dollar sign, right? The comment symbol, that's not a dollar sign, it's a hashtag or a pound symbol, whatever. I put that in front of the uh, default, so that way we don't get all those extra things for me to scroll through. I get tired of me having to scroll all the time. So let's run this and see what happens. All right, so scroll to the top. So found a bunch of Chrome, and it did those all in red. And then here you can see that it found Microsoft Edge, and so it wrote that one, and then it found Microsoft Edge CP. So it did exactly what we wanted. We got wildcard matching, but we were able to use the dollar sign underscore to get the variable. So the next up, well, let's get a little crazier. Let's take this one more step further and kind of help you really understand a lot more of the power and put it all into context. <laughs> That's what my little com note was here, right? Do some real work. So what are we going to do? We're going to put all of the procs um, in the variable again, all right? We're going to set some counter variables. So Chrome count equals zero, edge memory equals zero, Remember, anytime you're doing uh, counters and stuff in the script list, you can run over and over again. You always need to set them back to zero so that, that way you don't end up just, you know, counting over and over and over and, you know, getting exponentially bigger numbers. Okay? So then we're going to do the same thing again. For each P and proc, switch on a wildcard for process name. That's all the same. For Chrome, right host found the name, for count colors red. But now we showed you, reminded you that in your switch statement, you can put a um, semicolon, or that's a, that's a semicolon, good job. Oh, my words are hard for me today. What are my symbols? I don't even know. Anyway, semicolon, and then you can do Chrome count, right? So that's the Chrome count variable, and we're gonna set Chrome count the variable equal to Chrome count plus one. So we're just gonna count how many Chrome counts uh, there is. You could do that probably in seven different ways. It'd be better than what I'm doing here, but this is just showing you that you can have multiple commandlets inside your uh, switch statement. You can even have switches inside your switches. I haven't really found a scenario where that made any sense whatsoever, but I did test it earlier today, and you can have switches inside your switches. You can have ifs. You know, and we're showing examples where the switch statement's just got, you know, 50 characters in there. Um, if I think back to that reporting services example, you know, that I did for customer, my switch statements would have had 1,000 lines of PowerShell, I mean, 1,000, 225 lines of PowerShell in each one of those if statements because that was how much, or each one of the switch statements because that's how much I was doing. So definitely, uh, you know, I, I oversimplify things here because we're learning, but you can now go and apply all the PowerShell magic you know and put it between these curly braces and it's all going to run every time it matches Chrome. For the Microsoft uh, Edge matches, what I did here, right, same thing, right host found what the name is, write it in yellow, and then a new commandlet. And here we're going to track edge memory. And we're going to set edge memory equals to edge memory plus dollar sign p dot working set, right? So 
my first instinct here was to actually use dollar sign underscore dot working set. But remember, dollar sign underscore doesn't represent an object. It, well, I mean, it is, it's, but it's a string object. It's just the word Microsoft Edge CP. There's no values. It's not the whole processor, uh, the whole process object like we had before. So that's why I ended up using the for each loop. And so then dollar sign P, we know that that value is the current uh, process in the pipe. So then I was able to take advantage of dollar sign P dot working set, and that's what enables us to uh, get the amount of memory that it's using. So we're going to grab for each edge uh, process, we're going to know how much memory it's working, put it in one so we, at the end we can report on it. All right. We still have default commented out. And so then what are we going to do? Write host. There are, and then however many Chrome processes running, so I think it's like 28 on my machine. I have a lot of windows open apparently. Then we're going to do a little calculation. Dollar sign edge memory equals this crazy formula. And if you don't remember what this is, this was on one of my, I think my second ever PowerShell video, and there'll be a link below, it's the objects PowerShell video. But in there, what we're doing is we're converting the big nasty number that we were getting into a nice clean readable number. Here, we'll, we'll comment this one out the first time we run it so you can see what this looks like. And then we're gonna write host edge is using edge memory gigs, right? So let's hit go. So there are 24 Chrome processes running. I must've closed a couple. And then Edge is using one, and that should actually say bytes of memory. So this nasty number is what we get rid of with this line, right? So I'm gonna get this line, and then we'll hit play. And so now we can see we're actually just using 1.82 gigs of memory. So this little chunk of code right here translated uh, Edge memory into gigabytes, and it went ahead and said it to only show us two decimal places instead of the 74 that it wanted to show us the first time. So hopefully that's the type of stuff that helps you guys out, right? There's a little bonus learning uh, for sticking, sticking with me here. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about with Switch is that Switch, a uh, Switch, not Switch, Switch will also let you pass in an array. So in this case, Switch 2, comma 1. If we run this, you're going to see that it says you typed 2, U typed 1. So it's uh, going to do the checks for both the values in there. So this could be useful if you're pulling in um, arrays of data, you know, you're working with arrays. We've talked about those in some other videos. But this uh, shows you switch can do and process on both of those. Or if you don't want it to process on both of those, you always want to process on the first one it matches, then what you could do, um, and you'll see this a lot, but you do a break. And so break says, you know, quit doing this switch thing or quit doing different uh, looping mechanisms. We use it a lot in PowerShell when we start writing uh, loops and scripts. But so now if we run this, you'll see that it it found it matched with two. So it was like, oh, I got this. And so it broke off. Whereas if we change this to a three, what's going to happen? It's just going to match the one, right? It's going to try the three. There was nothing to do when it matched on three. So then it, uh, so it gave up and it tried again with one and it matched on one. So, um, you know, not, once again, I don't have a great example of where you would use this, but it's the little things that I think I want to make sure you're programming in your head. There's a lot more you can do with Switch once you guys get a little more comfortable with it and you kind of go through these first early examples. And really, I think that about sums it up for today. You know, that gives us a good walkthrough of Switch. It uh, hopefully shows you where you can take your if statements and maybe not have so much nesting, make your scripts a little more, a little less complex uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, if you have any thoughts, you want to see me explore other topics, you need more on this, any of that, leave me comments below. They always, uh, you know, I always respond to people. And that's how a lot of these videos get made is people ask for the information and then I make a video to answer their question instead of just helping them, right? I try to help everyone. All right, well, great. So thanks and have a great day. Me again. Hey, just a reminder, if you want to subscribe, click on my face over here. Or if you want to work together or just need a friend, hit me up over here. Or if really what you wanted was more PowerShell videos, it's probably it. They are over here. All right. Thanks. See ya. Somebody stop the recording.